Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Kristen Talbot, and I am the program coordinator for the Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and for our friends at La Clinica de la Raza for hosting today's session on menopause update with Dr. Jan Herr. Dr. Herr is a board certified obstetrician gynecologist. She retired from Kaiser Permanente in San Rafael, California after 33 years of practice. Her focus in recent years has been midlife women's health and minimal, minimally invasive surgery. She was the Kaiser Permanente Northern California lead for midlife women's health. Dr. Kerr, Dr. Herr currently does some work as a surgical assistant and is a UCSF volunteer clinical faculty instructor. She also worked to get the Rota Care Free Women's Health Center in Richmond, California off the ground and both volunteers and assist the administration of this program. And she is one of our Maven volunteers. So we are very excited to have her today. Dr. Herr, when you are ready, please begin. Thanks, Kristen. Um, I'll start by saying that this is my mascot and she's been with me uh, attending my lectures since the mid, mid 1980s uh, and has ridden the roller coaster with me from back there in the beginning when hormones were basically thought to be good for just about every woman. And then going into 2002, when uh, the use of hormones plummeted as uh, they became villainized uh, by the WHI results, the Women's Health Initiative Study. And now that's when she bought a fan, but I'm happy to say that uh, going forward, we've come to a place where menopause is again being looked at in a scientific way and reanalyzed, and there are some new recommendations that I'd like to uh, go over with you. So just before I start, um, I have no disclosures. Uh, and the accreditation was mentioned by Kristen. Um, today, I thought I would focus on mostly symptoms of menopause uh, with regard to vasomotor, vasomotor symptoms, but also, uh, of course, their treatment. Um, it's a very big area of menopausal medicine, as it should be, and it's getting more attention uh, of late, which is uh, overdue. So I'll start with terms and abbreviations. I'll then discuss menopausal hormone therapy, the recent benefit risk data and contraindications, and then go into the non-hormonal treatment options for menopausal symptoms. So here are the terms, and I'll just uh, point to a few of these. Um, it's gone through a lot of iterations, but currently MHT, menopausal hormone therapy is the most popular uh, term used, not HRT. That went out quite a while ago, although you still see it when you read articles, but HRT implies replacement therapy and it's not really replacing something. Uh, it's more that it's treating symptoms. Um, and then going down the list, uh, GSM, uh, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, is relatively new term that's taking a long time to catch on, I think because it's not as easy to, to say, uh, but that encompasses the vulvo vaginal as well as genitourinary type symptoms. Uh, so both bladder and other symptoms of menopause that are localized. Um, and I think everything, all the others are pretty commonly used. So looking at uh, the first case, I thought I would do this in a case-based way. I think that all of these these two cases and certainly everything that this woman will describe will will sound very familiar to you. This woman is 52. She had her last period a year ago and her BMI is 28. She's tried uh, 
recommended OTC supplements and weight loss to no avail. He also uh, happily has a negative past uh, medical and family history and drinks about one glass of wine twice a week or less. And she wants to know, should she start hormones because she's losing her mind with these uh, symptoms? So here we have factors that we have to consider when any patient uh, comes into the office. Uh, intensity and frequency of the hot flashes. Is she a candidate for MHT? Does she have a personal choice? Uh, this patient is saying to me that she is interested in at least hearing about hormones, uh, but some women are clear that they don't want to go that route. And does she have other symptoms uh, that should be considered? Depression, insomnia, et cetera. So here we are. Uh, I thought we should first just have an overall um, view of where things are at here. Um, there's the, there are experts, and then there are a lot of people that so general experts, and then there are certainly a lot of other surrounding experts uh, that are not as mainstream. So I tend to quote North American Menopause Society, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, um, American Heart Association. Those are uh, the experts that I'm referring to today. Um, and there ha this is not, so fast moving these days as it used to be. Uh, the WHI that came out in 2002 and then all the uh, break off studies from that and analysis of different age groups, they pretty well occupied the literature for many years. Um, and now when new position statements come out, they don't come out very frequently. So here it is 2017. Uh, when North American Menopause Society yet last put out a statement, they're preparing to put out another statement sometime soon. Um, they, back in 2017, said MHT remains the most effective treatment for vasomotor symptoms and genitourinary genito syndrome of menopause and has been shown to prevent bone loss and fracture. And around the same time, JAMA came out saying menopause hormones do not shorten lives. And this, this was a big deal because menopause look, the, the menopause hormone therapy looked so bad after that WHI came out that it looked like there wasn't a reason on earth why you would want to give hormones to a woman no matter how much she was suffering. So this in 2017 is about when when things started to be looked at in a little bit uh, uh, more scientific way, not just looking at a large chunk of women as as was so for the WHI across a very large spectrum of age with an average age of 63 years old, but rather breaking it down into what is going on with women that are closer into menopause versus women that are older? And I say that's more scientific because looking at such a large uh, and diverse population as was uh, the case in the WHI really, in my opinion, sent us down um, a path that was not, not really the whole picture for a lot of women. So, um, now, uh, when I say things are moving along, and I, I think there's optimism in the field of menopausal medicine, I'll point to the American Heart Association uh, scientific uh, statement that said that there's evidence that supports cardiovascular benefit of MHT that's initiated among women with premature or surgical menopause and within 10 years of menopause in women with natural menopause that the benefits appear to outweigh the risks for the majority of early menopausal women. 
that perimenopausal women should be provided individual guidance on MHT and options for treatment, particularly when vasomotor symptoms are present. So I have to say at this point that it's never going to be easy. I think the last time hormones were considered kind of an easy subject was definitely pre the WHI. We have to accept that there is no magic that is going to fit every woman and we are going to need to think about it for every woman, what is best for her considering her risk benefit profile. So looking at um, the contraindications, I think it's important to do this right off because we don't want to uh, give this to women that really is not safe to uh, even consider it for. And this is the short list of those uh, patients, although it can certainly include a large uh, percentage of a given day's patient list. Most women, in fact, are good candidates for hormones early on. And then there are the um, the benefits to look at. And I choose to do this start benefits um, based on um, a little video that I saw recently that is on the NAMS um, website, if you're a NAMS member, that was about uh, treating menopausal symptoms. And there was a speaker whose name is Juliana King, who's at um, the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale. And she is uh, the chair of the Women's Health Division and an internist. And she says that she is now talking to women about hormones by starting with the benefits and then going on to the um, risks because hormones have been given so much negative press that it's hard if you start the, with risks, it, women just shut down, even women that might really benefit from taking them. So I thought I'd take her approach. And here's the list. I, I um, the uh, so decreased osteoporosis and fracture risk is a big one. Certainly, uh, diabetes, insulin resistant, heart disease in young women. So less than sixty or within ten years uh, from the initiation of menopause, it decreases lipid deposition in the carotids depression and anxiety, joint pain and stiffness, sleep disturbance, and all-cause mortality in the estrogen alone group. Uh, it also improves uh, physical functioning, maybe work pro productivity, skin collagen, and sexual function in early menopause. So a lot of good things. Now, Going on a little bit more about this, I just do want to mention um, two things. First of all, we often get asked about bioidentical hormones, and there's been a lot of direct-to-patient advertising about them that suggests that there are more benefits and less risks with the bioidenticals, but that is not true. Um, and the problem with the bioidenticals when I say bioidenticals, I mean the, bio, the hormones that are made by compounding pharmacies. The problems with them relate to uh, inconsistency from batch to batch, no safety monitoring uh, by the FDA, um, and really very little uh, documentation uh, with regard to the science. So I think that is... Um, very important to keep in mind. In fact, when women come in asking for a bioidentical, my response is that we actually have uh, bioidenticals that are now FDA approved and have not have been for quite a long time. And that is uh, estradiol and micronized progesterone, 
estradiol and progesterone are what women have in their own bodies. So they are, in fact, as bioidentical as can be. Um, another thing that I want to just say about the benefits is that, and I think up to date put it well, when they expressed what the current opinion is regarding hormones, and that is that in spite of these reassuring data, MHT is only indicated for the management of menopausal symptoms in younger women, not for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease, and that for women who are recently menopausal, the improvement in vasomotor symptoms must still be weighed against other potential risks of treatment. So that is still the major talking point of uh, the experts, although up to date points out that cardiovascular disease is not usually considered a major factor in the equation. And I think that that's the part that may be changing um, following the American Heart Association's opinion and um, some of the new recommendations that I believe will be coming out, but we'll see. So in the risk category, we've got um, a small risk of breast cancer risk after five, um, five years of hormone, menopause hormone therapy, and that is only with the estrogen progesterone therapy. So only when a woman has to take estrogen plus progesterone. Now, I don't think anybody can say with certainty what happens when a woman takes even estrogen alone for many decades. But as far as we can see from the data that we have, it's only the estrogen plus progestin type of hormone that seems to be increasing the risk of breast cancer. And then only by a small amount. Um, particularly um, in the first 10 years um, after menopause, then the risk is very, very low. Um, and in fact, um, we talk about this, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit further when I talk about um, breast cancer in a slide that's coming up. There's also um, other risks. Um, stroke is there, and it's there at all ages, uh, and maybe less with transdermal estrogen, but we need bigger uh, randomized controlled studies before we could ever say that. So in young women, though, and I'll call young menopausal women, women that are under 60 or within 10 years of menopause, this, or no, in this case, I'm sorry, I should say young women are women under 60. The stroke risk is extremely low or possibly completely non-significant because it is so rare. Um, and it does start to climb gradually after that. Um, if hormones are started late, then heart disease is a risk. Uh, and venous thromboembolism is a risk with estrogen, but likely not with transdermal estrogen. And gallstones, again, likely not with transdermal estrogen and also are rare. And then there may be a slightly increased risk of ovarian cancer. So all things that are very important to consider. So looking at cardiovascular disease, um, the meta-analysis of randomized trials shows a 30 to 48% reduction in CHD and in all-cause mortality um, in women that are less than 60 or less than 10 years out from menopause. The Cochrane uh, review, the last one was in 2015, showed that women that were under 60 or less than 10 years from menopause had a reduced risk of CHD of 50% and of all-cause mortality of 30%, that the null effect was present for stroke risk, and that there was an increased risk of DVTs. 
again, this, I should say the Cochrane review was only with for oral MHT. It did not include transdermal. And that's because there haven't been any studies really that looked at this specifically at that slice of hormone therapy that could be included. And then if you look at women over 60 or more than 10 years since menopause, then there's a null effect on CHD risk and all-cause mortality, but an increased risk of CVA and venous thromboembolism risk. And the other study that I think is important to mention right here is the ELITE study, because it looked at estrogen at one milligram oral daily and showed that if it was taken within first six years after menopause, it significantly reduced the progression of lipid deposition in the carotid artery. Now, that, that's an important study. There was another study at the same time, KEEPS, that didn't show that, but used a lower dose of estrogen. So I'd say that we don't have enough data. We need more. Now, looking at... Um, breast cancer, I think that the way that Jewel King, the physician that I mentioned earlier, who's at a Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, the way she put it is that for the young women, there's less than one additional case per thousand women uh, that would uh, get breast cancer, and that the risk is similar to a sedentary life, lifestyle or obesity. So these risk factors are equivalent to the risk factor of taking hormones in that first uh, 10 years. So um, if you look at WHI, which is what's listed down below here, the estimated breast cancer risk um, overall was found to be at age 55, you would say it, if it's 4% baseline, it's 4.1% on estrogen plus progestin therapy. And then if you do a calculation based on their numbers, you'd see that at age 95, if someone's taking estrogen plus progestin therapy, they would have a 12% a 14.5% incidence of breast cancer versus 12% if they were not. So we are talking small numbers, but there is a problem when you start looking at large population. If you look at population data, then these numbers can still be concerning. And then we talk about neuroprotection, which is something that becomes increasingly important to women. They're not thinking about it so much in the first 10 years, but it gets to be more and more concerning as time goes on. And I am still, I still refer back to the Cache County uh, observational study, and that was already a very long time ago, but they've continued to do follow-up. And Cache County, first, uh, the first wave of interviews was in 1995, and it, it was a study that uh, was done in a very large, Mor the very large Mormon population, um, and Mormons live a long time, so they can be studied for a long time, which was one of the benefits of choosing this population. They also tend to have fewer vices, um, so it's a more uh, pure uh, cohort. And they looked at women with long-term ongoing use of hormone therapy. They found that estradiol uh, was positively associated with cognitive status, and that would be including um, um, executive function and verbal memory. Those are the two where, where it uh, really showed up. And that with longer use, as women got older, they had higher cognitive status in later life. Um, and the higher score, the highest scores were for women who initiated hormones in, within the first five years um, versus women that uh, started them later, six years or more. 
and that um, I think um, with hormone, I'm sorry, this last line doesn't really make, I think it's pretty much repetitive, so I'm not going to go into that. And then there were no changes in cognition in, in the WHI study or in the Kronos uh, early estrogen prevention study, but it, it, the WHI was in women over 65 and also Kronos had elder older women in it. So it doesn't, um, there were some, oh, it, actually the bigger problem with Kronos was that it's only a four year study. So it just wasn't long enough um, to, um, to really be definitive at all. So we're still looking back at this study that was started in 95, but has continued to have follow-up uh, reports. Um, the next, um, the next slide, I'm sorry, the, the top of my screen doesn't show because the little uh, Zoom thing is there. So I just have to, this is the one on oral hormone therapy. Okay, so for oral hormone therapy, uh, women in the health initiative study who were under 60 had an absolute risk of stroke from standard dose of hormone therapy, which was considered rare, two additional strokes per 10,000 women. Um, now, of course, when women get older, these risks baseline are greater and they are greater for women that take hormones. But when the WHI first came out, all these women were bunched together and the risks looked higher. So now that the follow-up studies to the WHI have been uh, published and analyzed ad nauseum, it, it's clear that when you separate out the younger women from the rest of the category, which is only 31% of the total WHI population, those women have very low risks of stroke and probably even null in the very younger of the group. And then in the meta-analysis of the randomized trials, which included heavily the WHI, uh, unfortunately, so it isn't really any different in a way than looking at the WHI data, um, it looked like oral estrogen um, and EPT were both associated with ischemic stroke, but not with hemorrhagic stroke or TIA. And among women that had a stroke, there was a trend toward more fatal strokes, but it wasn't um, looked at by age. So it's uh, just to give you more background. Transdermal estrogen, um, as I mentioned before, is thought to have little or no effect on clotting factors, little or no BTE risk, and less or no stroke risk at the lower doses, so 0.05 or less. And we can't say definitively um, transdermal does not have any effect on clotting factors because all the studies are observational, but they're large and they're pretty convincing. Um, the, it's the route of choice for women that are, are over 60, who are obese, that have a higher than BTE risk, but that you might be comfortable using hormones uh, for. Uh, if their CVD risk is above average and if they're a smoker. And this is unfortunate because it's not as accessible uh, depending on insurance, et cetera, um, as the oral. So it's, uh, but it is, there are generics of the transdermals now. And so it's a lot more in reach for a lot more women. Um, is there a risk to stopping hormones? Uh, this was an interesting study. It was in Finland and um, it showed that there was an increased risk of cardiac death and strokes within the first year stopping hormone therapy. Um, now this um, study is basically just is sending out, I think, signals that we need to look at this, that there need to be more um, 
larger and more randomized controlled studies looking at this before we can say, oh, maybe this is real. The WHI did not pick up on this. They showed neutral results in their follow-up studies, but again, it was much of, more of a um, gamush of women by age, et cetera. So this study out of Finland didn't tell us why women stopped and didn't look at why women started hormones. Um, and there were a number of other uh, facts that we didn't have because it was uh, used from a, it was information drawn from a, a registry. So they didn't have that information. So it's just something to think about that everybody, when everyone just went off the WHI, uh, after the WHI, um, there may there are other implications. It's not so easy to just pull it and let women uh, use their fans. Okay, um, just switching gears a little bit. Uh, the newest uh, option on in the hormone realm are the is a, a, a category called PSEX, tissue selective estrogen complex. Um, and this is a very interesting concept where estrogen is combined with the serum. And with that, women don't need to take progestin. And since progestin seems to be the bad actor, um, this could be a very good thing. Unfortunately, the only uh, product that's available is oral. And that means that there is the thromboembolic risk uh, not probably a big deal in young women, but if women stay on it as they get older, um, that's our concern. And also it's conjugated equine estradiol, not, estra not estradiol alone. And that's, um, I'm sorry, it's, it's CEE, conjugated equine estrogen, not estradiol. And estradiol may be the safer estrogen. Again, the studies aren't uh, definitive, but it suggests it. So here's the counseling strategy. If a woman starts to take hormones and uh, is taking it for a few years, it's a good idea to try a lower dose if she isn't already on low dose but to not tell her that there's no option to increasing if she needs to. We have to look at the risk benefit in her case. To continue on low or ultra low dose uh, for women, um, basically go down to that level and then maybe try to stop it, but not definitely. And then, uh, if women have an elevated osteoporosis risk uh, or feel much better on hormones to actually consider continuing the low dose therapy long term. Uh, to transition to transdermal estrogen if a patient stays on estrogen after age 60 and to consider the type of formulation um, that she's taking, if she only needs estrogen, then it's very reasonable to consider uh, leaving her on estrogen. In fact, there may be benefits that well outweigh the risks for her. Uh, with progestin, the risks are raised, but really only slightly overall. Um, Five years of HT is not an absolute start, uh, stopping point. So for women that really want to stay on hormones, focus on a healthy lifestyle, limiting alcohol, breast cancer screening, because those things will all affect her risks going forward. And there are other ways to keep those risks low. Um, this statement by Joanne Manson, who's really an icon in women's midlife women's health, um, I think sums it up by saying that women, uh, for many women, risks associated with hormones are offset by reductions in symptoms, improved quality of life, benefits in other health outcomes, such as fractures. 
the net effects of hormones are most favorable for recently menopausal women who have moderate to severe vasomotor symptoms and low or average risk for breast cancer, cardiovascular disease, and venous thromboembolism. If women are above Average risk for the latter conditions that those women may want to avoid hormones and consider non hormonal options for management of symptoms. That, of course, women deserve reliable information in order to make informed decisions aligned with their personal preferences on whether potential outweigh potential benefits outweigh risks. Um, so, going on with that, as has been mentioned. Um, quite a few times here, there are women that can't take hormones. So after I mentioned the plan for this patient, we'll talk about a patient in that category. So this patient, after conversation, decided that she wanted to try hormones, that she thought it would give her the greatest likelihood of relief uh, and at the soonest possible date. She was prescribed transdermal estradiol and micronized progesterone. And I'll mention that micronized progesterone that's given continuously on a daily basis, most women on low dose hormones or low dose estrogen won't have bleeding. And that is the preference of most women that are menopausal. But if a woman is agreeable to taking it, the progesterone or the progestin cyclically, uh, she may have a lower risk of breast cancer. It looks like there is a difference. Um, just like in younger women, the luteal phase has the progesterone that, when, that stimulates uh, uh, mitotic activity in the breast. So giving progesterone just for half of the month might be safer, uh, but it's, still only theoretical and it is not preferred by women if there's a risk that they will have bleeding. Of course, the lower the dose is, the less likelihood that they will bleed, but it's still a significant issue. And then we can't just send her away and not revisit it. That used to be done. One prescription at age 50 and women just kept taking it. But really in the, in the current climate and with the current information, we need to revisit it at least every few years and to at least offer to taper off over time and stop at three to five years if they choose. So now I'll just um, go over the second case. Um, and this is a woman who's 56 and diagnosed with um, an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer a year ago who's having a lot of hot flashes and sleep interruption. She's had lumpectomy and radiation. She's currently taking an aromatase inhibitor. She's tried various OTC supplements and lost some weight to try and decrease her uh, problem, and it has not helped. Uh, she has a negative family history for thromboembolic disease, cardiovascular disease, and cancer and she wants to know what she can do. And this part of the talk is shorter because there is a lot less that has been really uh, proven to effectively help women in this category. But SSRIs and SNRIs, as well as uh, Depo uh, Provera, Depo Medroxyprogesterone Acetate, um, is are definitely um, approaches that can work, as can the gabapentinoids and occasionally clonidine. Um, now, looking at the SSRIs, SNRIs, they do the studies do show a reduction in hot flash frequency and severity. Um, but what's really important to remember is that the placebo effect is very high. Depending on studies, different studies, it could be as high as 60%. So it's hard to say how much effect. And it seems like it's not the same for every woman. Some women really do get significant relief. Um, sertraline and fluoxetine haven't been shown to be 
clinically effective. Uh, paroxetine should be avoided with tamoxifen. Um, paroxetine is, however, at the 7.5 milligram dose, the only medication that is uh, FDA approved. Um, and if you start a woman on SSRI, the citalopram 20 milligrams appears to be an optimal dose. You don't really need higher doses. Um, and of course, there's a secondary benefit of improvement in mood um, fluctuation and depression. Um, and I'll mention that although it's not FDA approved, the 10, 10 milligrams of paroxetine, which is a half of the 20 milligram tablet is much lower cost and is considered um, a reasonable approach. Um, so when I mentioned paroxetine and fluoxetine is the other one, they have effects on uh, cytochrome, cytochrome P450 and that is why they should be avoided with tamoxifen. And all of the, the um, uh, list that I had on the uh, previous page are, uh, I should mention, are uh, level one evidence except for the clonidine, which is level two. So now we get on to other things that have been proven um, to work. Um, and as I said, there are not uh, that very many of them. Um, but uh, for vasomotor symptoms, there's some uh, data on cognitive behavioral therapy, clinical hypnosis, mindfulness training, stellate ganglion block, and KNDY receptor antagonists. Um, now, the first three are somewhat available, although uh, depending on insurance and where the woman lives, they may not be at all readily available. Stellate ganglion block is really uh, only available in very specific centers that are studying this. Uh, there are KNDY receptor antagonists that are not on the market yet, but they're being studied. So uh, not, not in our uh, toolbox at this point. And I'll mention a little bit more about that because I think it's exciting. So now looking at the next um, level, this is where there's inconsistent evidence. Um, so not, not that encouraging. Acupuncture has been claimed by the acupuncturist to be effective, um, but it's very hard to uh, do good studies and it hasn't in the studies that, that look decent been shown to be more effective than sham acupuncture. Um, and um, the other things that we often profess as working are not convincingly effective. Black cohosh was worried about for a long time because of liver, uh, possible liver toxicity, but follow-up studies haven't pointed to that. It's just not very effective. Um, the next... Um, list is of the ineffective um, therapies that are often touted, so I mentioned those here. And um, the Chinese herbalists uh, point to the fact that we're not using the right uh, concoctions in the studies that have been done, but unfortunately there aren't studies in any specific concoctions that have been shown to work. Doesn't mean it doesn't work, but we can't point to the science. So then um, moving on from there, we can talk about gabapentin, which works for some people quite well. Um, and the problem is that it's sedating um, and the side effects are not always tolerated. Uh, if you start at 100 milligrams and titrate up every three days, it may be uh, tolerable. And using it just at nighttime for insomnia and beta vasomotor symptoms can also be the way to go. Um, the most effective is at 300 milligrams TID, but 
I haven't met very many women that can tolerate that and function. Um, looking at um, clonidine, um, it's more effective than placebo, but less than the two previous um, slides. And uh, you can start with uh, the patch and then um, see how it goes, but you have to warn a patient about uh, hypertension, particularly postural, um, and then headache, dry mouth, and constipation. So there's an occasional woman that finds this helpful, but it's not the first thing that I would uh, try. Um, and then I'll just mention here these uh, neurokinin-3 receptor antagonists. They, the, the big deal about this is that it's been discovered that there are neurons that project into the therm thermoregulatory zone in the brain. And these, uh, this area, the, the receptors, uh, hypertrophy when there is when there's no estrogen around. So if you have a, a, a antagonist that can go in there and block the receptors so that then the neurons don't uh, go ahead and stimulate uh, the, the thermoregulatory zone, then you would have a way to centrally block cod flash generation. And these are the three compounds that are being looked at for that. And um, forgive me if that wasn't super clear. It took me a while to wrap my head around it. But basically, if we, this would be a non-hormonal approach um, if it pans out. Um, and we definitely need bigger studies. Uh, but this would be certainly for women that couldn't take hormones or didn't choose to take hormones. And it might be the first effective um, uh, approach. However, as I point out here, in their study, the one study that was done, the placebo effect, uh, they quoted as only being 27%, which is really very low. And um, so we need larger studies uh, before we can really say anything about whether this is going to pan out, but there are a lot of um, investors that are hoping that it will. Um, so for case number two, uh, I would start with this trial of citalopram, 20 milligrams. If that didn't work, I'd try venlafaxine, uh, which is harder to get off of and is associated with weight gain, so it concerns me to go there first. Um, and then I might play with uh, clonidine. Um, I would refer the patient for CBT or mindfulness training if that were available. And then the last two slides are just some references that I didn't put on specific slides that I thought you might be interested in. So with that kind of whirlwind, tour of the state of hormones as it stands. I'll be happy to answer questions, or at least try to. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone um, for listening and Dr. Her for, for presenting. Um, we do have one question. I know I saw Dr. Sidor's hand raised, so I'll get to that as well. If you do have a question, please remember to either use the Q&A box, the chat box, or raise your hand. So the first question, and forgive me, there are medications in there, which are my downfall. I have always read that mirs, mirs, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to spell this one for you, Dr. Her. It is M-I-R-T-A-Z-A-P-I-N-E, maybe yeah. beneficial. Mirtazapine. Okay. <laughs> so the question is, I have also read that that may be beneficial. Um. I, you know, I can't, I've never tried it. And um, it may be a reflection of the fact that, you know, I'm practicing at a much lower level than I was up to five years ago. So I'll have to look into that. But um, I'm sure there are no big studies, but it might be another option. All right. Dr. Sador, I have given you the ability to unmute yourself so you can just click the microphone and speak directly with Dr. Her. Okay. Okay. 
Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, Jan, um, excellent talk on a, a subject with all kinds of moving parts, so kudos to you. Um, a couple of comments. One is that with the menopausal hormone therapy risk, one thing to consider adding to that list is hypertriglyceridemia, um, which is relatively common in the public. And for some susceptible women who already have baseline, estrogen therapy can exacerbate it. And some people can develop levels that would be potentially concerning. So, um, you know, um, a fasting lipid panel prior to that, if a patient has not had it, would be worth um, considering. The other one is um, the beneficial effects of estrogen in terms of the bones. You're absolutely right. And with this pendulum swinging back and forth where women, like you said so well, we're getting estrogen, you know, carte blanche for decades, and then pendulum swinging where they were not getting estrogen. And now um, there's more and more patients who are getting it um, for a finite period of time. Estrogen protects bones while given, but once it's stopped, then the bone um, loss can fairly quickly go down to a level where uh, the bones would have been had there not been any estrogen given. So just for um, primary care folks to be aware that um, patients would need monitoring and possibly another um, therapy to slow down bone loss. Yeah, thank you. Uh, both of those are, are great points. Um, uh, the osteoporosis, of course, is another whole wonderful area to explore and talk about. And um, I would say that there is now, as you say, I feel like I've been holding on to this pendulum for my whole career, and it is swinging towards at least giving it to women in the first 10 years, which means that the other uh, drugs that they would have needed in those first 10 years, if they already have bones that are not great, they won't need. So that it sort of pushes everything down the line, which is, I think, very good. Uh, and saves the big guns, uh, so to speak. But really, estrogen is as good at as a, is as good at protecting the bone as are the other uh, non-hormonal treatments, um, and uh, for raising bone density. So it's it's co complicated, um, and it's true. If a woman has a bone density on estrogen, you can't assume it's going to be good when she goes off or even very shortly after she goes off of hormones. Um, Craig, the other question I have for you is my impression is, but maybe I'm wrong, that with transdermals, you, do, you definitely don't get as much uh, uh, beneficial change in the appearance of lipids. Uh, we don't know if it makes any difference or not, oral uh, LFHs, HDL, et cetera, and that's a complicated question. But I was under the impression transdermal didn't raise the triglyceride as much. Is that is that your is that true? Yeah, um, that's a good point. You know, you're avoiding with the oral the first pass effect in the liver, and it goes right systemically. Um, being cautious, it's worth if you have a patient who's maybe prone to hypertriglyceridemia, rechecking her on uh, the level. You know, maybe six to eight weeks later. Um, just to make sure that um, things aren't exacerbated. Right. So my druthers would be for every woman to take transdermal. Um, it just hasn't financially gotten to the point where I think that's doable and, and it depends on the population. Um, and my impression is that it's um, safer or better or at least theoretically safer um, depending on what you're talking about. And I think it's better for the triglycerides. But, you know, in general, menopausal women, if they come in with hot flashes, don't need very many labs. You don't have to try to figure out what's going on, rule out malignancy, hyper, um, hyperthyroidism, et cetera, et cetera, in the woman that's in the right age group. But there are some baseline, menopausal medicine is a much bigger field. And I think, Craig, what you're saying is, so important that there are things that we should be considering, uh, things that happen to women when they come to the point of menopause that we really, that's why we need a, a year's course on, on menopausal medicine, not an hour. Wonderful. 
Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Sador. If uh, you don't know, Dr. Sador is one of our other Maven Project volunteers. That was a real treat to hear both of you, you talk back and forth. Well, uh, I'm grateful to have heard his comments. Thank you. Next question. If a woman is on MHT dose or recently stopped, does it then change your DEXA, DEX, DEXA screening interval? <laughs> Okay, so this is what sort of uh, it was talked about just previously. Um, it, 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 over the, a year or two, it really will drop. So um, yeah, I mean, I'd say if a woman's on hormones, her, her, and she has a good bone density, it's gonna, it's gonna be good for as long as she's taking them. Um, and even ultra low dose, which is uh, uh, in, on the patches, at a half of the lowest, or well, no, there is one brand that comes in that dose. So like um, uh, 0.014 of um, estradiol, those, there was one small study that showed that bone density is maintained even on those really low doses. But when they stop, you should probably consider getting a bone density two to three years after they stop if you're worried about their bones or sooner if you, you know, depending on the risk level. Okay, our next question uh, is from one other Maven Project volunteer. Uh, what do you think of the patches that combine estrogen and progesterone? Okay, okay, great. Love to respond to that. I'm not fond of them because they are not generic as far as I know. So they're really expensive and not within reach of a lot of women. But more importantly, when you start to taper the progesterone, they don't, you don't have the flexibility. Um, if you cut those patches in half, we're not sure you're gonna get uh, the right enough progestin to protect the uterus. Um, so they give you much less flexibility. So I, I've seen women that come in on it and I first thing I have to do is take them, you know, take away that patch and give them two uh, patch and an oral in order to be able to start to taper them down. So that's why I'm not really fond of it. It's fine if that's the dose you want to give, but it'll give you less flexibility going forward. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so we don't have any questions right now, but that's okay. If you forgot a question or you know, you're thinking about this later and you think, oh, I have a great idea or a great question, you can always reach out to Dr. Hurt uh, through our e-consult platform on BC or you can reach out to any of our Maven Project volunteers with any questions that you may have in the same way. Just a reminder that um, your CME survey is going to pop up at the end of this session in another tab. Uh, you had Dr. Jan Hur as your presenter, so please pay attention to that. And uh, we look forward to our next session. Dr. Hur, thank you so much for presenting today. It was really wonderful. Thank you, Kristen, and bye to everyone. <laughs>